speaker is Len Elmore. Len Elmore was an All-American basketball player at the University of Maryland, and in 2002 was voted one of the Atlantic Coast Conference's top 50 greatest basketball players. He was a first-round draft pick in both the American Basketball Association and the NBA, where he played professional basketball for 10 years. Mr. Elmore received his law degree from Harvard Law School in 1987 and is believed to be the first and only NBA player to graduate from that institution upon retirement from professional basketball. Following law school, Mr. Elmore served as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, New York from 1987 to 1990, where he managed and tried numerous misdemeanor and felony cases. He is currently senior counsel in the litigation group at uh, LaBeouf, Lamb, Green, and McRae in their New York City office. Mr. Elmore is a noted authority on sports and sports law issues and has had articles published on a variety of issues in sports and society. His sports law practice includes providing counsel on a broad range of uh, issues to professional sports leagues, national governing bodies, sports acquisition groups, and to professional athlete management companies. Other practice experience includes providing counsel in the areas of criminal defense, corporate governance, labor and employment law, urban economic development, strategic decision making, and marketing issues. Mr. Elmore is also in his 19th year as a basketball analyst, during which time he has covered both the NCAA men's, both NCAA men's basketball and the NBA for CBS and ESPN, including the NCAA tournament. Among his many diverse accomplishments, Mr. Elmore has been CEO of an educational testing company, TestU, has started his own sports agency, Precepts Sports and Entertainment, and currently serves as a director on the board of 1-800-Flowers.com and as a member of the Board of Trustees at the University of Maryland College Park. He also continues to serve on several other not-for-profit boards, including the Sports Lawyers Association and the National Basketball Retired Players Association, where he was elected president in February 2005. Mr. Elmore continues to fulfill his commitment to public service as a commissioner on the John and James L. Knight Foundation's Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics and is a member of the NCAA-appointed College Basketball Partnership Committee convened by the NCAA president to assist the advancement of the college game. We're very fortunate that he could join us today. Please welcome to Duke Law, Len Elmore. Thank you, Adam. That's pretty good. Adam, you delivered that well, as if I wrote it myself. Um, first of all, let me say, I, and I'm pleased to be able to come and, and visit with you guys. I uh, had a chance to sit out there and kind of reminisce a little bit, see when uh, class is over, how people mill around, and when the food is here, they do a U-turn and come back. And so if that's what it took to get you here, to bribe you, that's fine. Um, the other thing that I noticed is, you know, nobody's sitting in the front two or three rows. That's understandable. And, uh, but the thing that I find unique is that these chairs recline. What are you guys doing in class? <laughs> I know it, it, in my law school, nothing reclined. It was like straight spine, and obviously you see the products of Harvard Law School, but we won't, we won't go there. Um, let me say that uh, the title of, um, of this presentation, if you will, was something that I was kind of unaware of until I, I got Adam's email. But, uh, you know, having looked at it, I thought that it was a, a pretty, good, pretty good way to, to kick this thing off. And in doing so, what I'd like to be able to do is kind of provide maybe a, a, a deeper glimpse into what I consider my unfinished body of work. Um, you've heard some of the things that uh, I've been fortunate enough to do, but, you know, all of them have a genesis. And, you know, that genesis, obviously comes from my origins. And for a lot of people who don't know, and there's an awful lot out there on the internet, and including the blogs, which for those of you who participate, I read them, so just let you know. And I, I am known to email back under pseudonyms, so. <laughs> uh, but I, I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I, I came from a very modest family. My father uh, was relatively uneducated. Um, it, Left school in the 10th grade, uh, was fortunate to get a job with the city as a sanitation man, a garbage man. My mother was a high school graduate in, uh, you know, backwoods Louisiana, but couldn't go to college because family didn't have the money. Uh, she actually won a scholarship to Southern University, but had to go to New York and meet with my aunt so that they could make money and send back to the family in Louisiana. Um, so obviously, you know, having said that, in our generation and the generation before, education was very important to everyone, to the point where families would sacrifice to try to get their kids an opportunity. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to leave public school in New York to go to a, a private school uh, because of basketball, and that private school was Power Memorial Academy. Uh, my claim to fame is probably being the, the second 
the most well-known alum of Power Memorial. Anybody know who the most well-known Power Memorial grad is? Yeah, but he was a little cinder back then, so you get half credit for that. Uh, but yeah, and he's, he, was, uh, he was the forerunner. But obviously sports had a, a great influence on my life. Um, you know, that was the stepping stone. That was the escape, if you will, from the mean streets. And, you know, I was the type of kid who was influenced by a number of things. And, you know, my resume kind of reflects either an itinerant nature where I'm never satisfied with anything I do, so I keep doing other things, or someone who aspires to be a Renaissance person. And in my mind, my hero was a man by the name of Paul Robeson. Uh, I'm sure those of you who study history and the arts understand who Paul Robeson is. He was an All-American football player at Rutgers. Um, he was an All-American at a time when they took the pictures of the All-American team at the turn of the century, they wouldn't allow him to take the picture. Um, he was also a, uh, an attorney. He was a Columbia Law grad. He was a noted concert singer as well as an actor. And when I read his biography back in middle school, I thought to myself, you know, I want to do a lot of those things. And I guess the rest is history. But in the end, I, the thing that I want to be able to do is, is to kind of give you underpinnings as I explain how I got to where I am today. You know, I grew up during the tumultuous era of the civil rights struggles in the 60s as well as the war in Vietnam. And at that point in time, you know, in your awakening years, you know, you look at what's going on around you and you couldn't escape it. It's on television, it's in the streets. Um, you want to make a decision as to where you want to be. You can either be a bystander, an observer, or you can be in the parade, the parade for change. And a long time ago, I made up my mind that I wanted to be in that parade. So from there, you know, continuing, uh, you know, the aspirational path that I had set for myself, you know, through college, obviously playing basketball, trying to study, trying to have a good time. Um, I still got involved in some things from a volunteer standpoint going out in communities, working with kids in some of the surrounding communities in College Park and Washington, D.C. Um, just to backtrack for a moment, I mean, rec recruiting was pretty interesting because, quite honestly, I, I got recruited by Duke. And I actually liked the campus, believe it or not. The problem was, coming from the diverse background uh, that I came from in New York City, it would have been pretty difficult for me to come to a place like Duke knowing that you know, a lot of people that I knew and people who knew people, et cetera, from New York and New Jersey, et cetera. But my fear was what happens when I stepped off campus in 1970 and tried to seek that same type of diversity. So unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on your outlook, I didn't go to Duke. Uh, but again, at the University of Maryland was uh, is a place that I'm quite proud of um, as a university, quite proud of my ability to, to do some things that uh, in, in many ways were historical for that university, my teammates and I. But in the end, um, it was an experience that you know, left its impact on me simply because, again, I think I grew tremendously in my undergraduate years. And a lot of it had to do with basketball. A lot of it had to do with the exposure. A lot of it had to do with the necessity to mature and develop. You know, when mics are stuck in your face, and it's nothing like it is today. Um, nothing like these young men have to uh, endure. Um, but nevertheless, you're still in the limelight. And being in the nation's capital, um, it was increased probably tenfold as opposed to being in a smaller city. So it was really an obligation for me to develop and, and to be able to represent myself and my school and my family and my community in, in a way in which we'd all be proud. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to play well enough to, to play professional basketball. And again, another milestone was going out and living in different cities and being involved in some of the community endeavors. In Indianapolis, again, it goes back to there's something in me that wanted to be a teacher, but I knew teachers didn't make that much money. So I decided that I could, I could still volunteer and play professional basketball and got involved in, in some of the high schools in, in the Indianapolis area and some of the other cities. But the life and the lifestyle of a professional basketball player uh, requires people 
to keep pulling you down. You ever see the Macy's Day Parade? Pro ball players are like those, those uh, balloons. They, they need to have those strings attached and people need to continue to pull them down and keep their feet on the ground. And I, I would dare say that's the truth with any, um, any profession where you're young, money comes quickly, uh, fame comes quickly, and you never recognize that it's finite. But in the end, I think that, again, you learn from the ups and downs. I mean, having a great year one year and then injuring my knee and not ever being the same after my third year was something that brought me back down the ground. It, it, it made me understand that this was a finite career. And so from that moment, I had my sights set on what I was going to do after. And, and, and that's important because, you know, I'd always thought that the law was a way to be an agent for change. I talked about being in the parade as opposed to being an observer. And at that time, I thought that the law was socially redeeming. I thought that the law was the vehicle by which you know, I could be part of the liberation of minds, uh, vindicate rights, do all of the things, uh, the idealistic things that many of you probably came into this school thinking that that was, all, that was what it was all about. And just like you, or maybe not like you. Some of you guys uh, may have through your summer, summer jobs. I started to realize that that's not necessarily true, that there are myriad facets of the legal profession, and that if you choose to do the things that I spoke of, there's room. But there are other areas in which you can excel, and there are other areas where you can make a lot of money. There are other areas where you can gain a lot of fame and stature. Uh, there are other areas where you can educate. But in the end, it, it comes down to, you know, making choices. <clears throat> now, in my, um, in my next to last year, I started to realize, you know, my knees started to hurt. I wasn't getting nearly as much time. In fact, I was getting old. And it was time for change. And once again, I had to make, make some decisions. And my decision was, okay, it's time to go to law school. So the summer before my last year, Stanley Kaplan and I got to be really good friends. I spent a lot of time uh, in review courses in, in the summertime for the LSATs. And you know, that awakened in me that desire to prove pe to people that, hey, even after 10 years, you can still change. And that's something you, you guys need to keep in the back, backs of your minds because I can look around here right now and you know, the old um, uh, paper chase theme, look to the left, look to the right, somebody is gonna drop out of the legal profession. Somebody is gonna change direction in the legal profession. But the one thing that I can tell you is that the skills, the mode of thinking, the logic, the analytical approaches, those things will always serve you regardless of what you choose to do two years from now, five years from now, 20 years from now. But you've gotta understand it. And you've got to maintain those philosophical habits. You've got to be able to continue to sharpen them, whether you're practicing law in a large firm, whether you're working with a public interest firm, um, you know, whether you choose not to do anything at all. In the end, you can't waste what you've been given here. When I, uh, when I left Harvard, and, and while, actually while I was in, in the law school, um, you know, my pursuits ran along the lines of public interest. My first year, I was... Uh, uh, a student uh, advocate for landlord and, and, and tenants' rights, for tenants' rights against landlords. I also served as a summer intern for the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination as an investigator. Um, finally, I was a public defender. And, you know, those things opened my eyes to a lot. One thing, just to give you a quick anecdote, as a public defender in my third year in Massachusetts, you're able to essentially try preliminary, preliminary hearings. And I was involved in a case where someone was accused of aggravated rape. And it was my job to obviously, in a preliminary hearing, elicit as much information, as much evidence as I possibly could. And therefore, I had to cross-examine the victim. Now, I don't know if you, any of you all have been involved in criminal law. Uh, I don't know if any of you all have the sensibilities that I had, but that was most, one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Uh, simply because I knew that the person sitting next to me did something. But the question is, you know, has the government 
put forth enough evidence to charge what he charged. And so I had to go after this young woman as hard as I possibly could. And in the end, it was reduced because there was enough evidence to show that the government had overcharged. But it also had shaken me as far as what I wanted to do. I thought that being a public defender, being an advocate, you were standing up for the downtrodden. You were speaking for the voiceless. You were providing power to the powerless. When in effect, the voiceless and the powerless was on that stand, not necessarily sitting next to me. And that taught me something. And as I talked to my supervisor afterwards, he, as a former US attorney, said, you know what? You're right. And this is what you need to do. You need to start thinking about becoming a prosecutor. Because becoming a prosecutor, you now can be proactive instead of reactive. And, and I think that's a lesson that has carried with, that I've carried with me up until this point, about being proactive instead of reactive. Where if you're doing justice, as the Code of Professional Responsibility says that a pro prosecutor should do, then you're going to pursue you know, cases with vigor but with fairness. And that's something, again, that pushed me towards becoming a prosecutor in New York City. Now, I had a choice to go to Manhattan, you know, the very sexy practice that you see on, uh, on um, uh, I forget, Law and Order. That's Manhattan. Instead, I went to Brooklyn, where the nuts and bolts of crime really is in New York City. And I had an experience that, you know, usually people write about. They put it in books. And my book is coming out in another 10 years, so keep that in mind. But I got, I got an opportunity to, to do a range of things, from just trying basic misdemeanor cases where after my first three weeks of training, uh, all of a sudden, my supervisor walks in my office and dumps three files on my desk and says, this one's going to trial today, this one's going to trial next week. And of course, you know, you have to be ready. And you learn about balancing and, and proactivity. Um, <clears throat> but I also recognize, again, that the system is what it is and that fairness will always win out. Um, my maturity at, at 35 years old, when I got to the DA's office working with 25-year-olds, kind of had some influence. You know, I, I had a lot of colleagues who came from the Midwest and from the South and were very gung-ho in law and order and, you know, they'd get a shoplifter for the third time and they want to put him in jail for a year. Instead of looking at the rap sheet and seeing, you know, possession of a hypodermic needle, possession of a controlled substance, all this thing, the guy's a junkie. That's why he's shoplifting. You can put him in jail for a year and he'll be right back out and you'll be doing the same thing. Instead, let's try and find him a bed. Let's try and find him rehab. Let's hold this over his head until he eventually recognizes that, you know, you run out of chances. You know, that's, that's what maturity brings. That's what experience brings. And having been from New York City, it was probably incumbent upon me to pass that along. Um, so, you know, the street smarts were invaluable in, in the practice that I had. My final tour with the DA's office was law enforcement investigation, which was an elite group, and all we did was try police officers. We tried police officers for misconduct. We tried them for corruption. And I can tell you right now that that is probably the toughest job that you'll have because you work with them every day. And now you're working with the IAD, Internal Affairs. And you know, going home at night, you know, having a police officer on trial, you always have to look here and you have to look here. And you know, police cars pull up and they look at you and they give you that stare. Um, you know, walk the streets and you know, police cars following you in my neighborhood, which was the Upper East Side, um, you know, I had to pull out my shield and say, hey, I'm one of you guys. Uh, because again, it, it was difficult, but it was necessary. And this was obviously before the Rudy Giuliani days, which I'm not gonna go into right now, but if anybody ever wants to get me really politically active, let him run for president. I'll be on the hit squad in a minute, but that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole other story. Um, I can talk about New York City and, and those time, days and times, but. I probably shouldn't have brought that up because we're being recorded, but that's okay. Um, after, after about three and a half years, you know, recognizing that I wanted to get married and have a family, and it's hard to raise a family living in New York on $35,000 a year, um, it was time to move on to, to private practice. And you know, I got involved with a firm in Washington, D.C. and moved down near Patton Boggs. Anybody ever hear of Patton Boggs? The lobbying firm. But, also have a robust 
litigation division. You know, I got there, I was with a, a smaller private firm prior to that, and big firm life just didn't sit well with me at the time. The bureaucracy, the um, incredible greed, the um, you know, lack of a focus on doing a lot of the things that I wanted to do, um, it really, really set me off the wrong way. So I ultimately decided, you know, where can I next be proactive? Where can I next have some impact? And the kind of light bulb went on, sports. <clears throat> Gee, imagine that, me being in sports. That's when I started my, uh, my firm, Precept Sports, which represented professional athletes. In the first four and a half years, actually in the four and a half years that I had the firm, we wound up with seven first round draft picks. Um, we had a number of high draft picks in football. And I think a lot of it had to do with reputation, with responsibility, with experience. The problem was having that much success that quickly, uh, many of you probably have heard the stories about the agent business. All of a sudden now, you get a group of people and some of the most high-powered, high-profile agents in the business, all of a sudden now, aligning against Len Elmore. You know, we've got to find a way to shut Elmore down. We've got to slow him down. Because, again, I was selling something that they couldn't possibly sell, and that was prior experience. Having not only been a professional athlete, but being deeply involved in negotiations of my own contract, I think that resonated. And it also resonated with a lot of our clients because most of them were African Americans. And most of the high profile uh, agents weren't. And in the end, it was about telling guys that, look, you, know, you choose the best possible person for you. But it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, someone who doesn't look like you. That there are other people out here. There's a diversity of talent out here for you to be able to choose from. And again, I think that resonated with, with a number of guys to the point where it had shaken the, the uh, structure, the traditional structure, to the point where, again, you know, guys were writing letters to each other. These are guys who, if you brought them together in the same room and looked outside, they couldn't agree on whether the sky was blue or not. But they could agree on one thing. We've got to get this guy out of here. So what happens is the business starts to turn to a point where I walk into a young man's home and talk to his parents, and after I'm finished, they ask, okay, so you know, when am I getting the Range Rover? And you know, can we get $10,000 now and $25,000 later on? And I'm stepping back. I said, all I can give you is my hand and congratulate you on the next agent that you get, because I'm out of here. I can't do that. And it started to happen over and over and over again to the point where I had to make a choice. Even though we were successful to remain successful, I had to stoop to conquer. It was either give up the ethics, give up the professional responsibility that's, that's been ingrained, and be like a lot of these guys who, who are lawyers but have never practiced law in their lives, or to step out of the business and find another way to be able to send the same message. And the message that I tried to give to young athletes was self-reliance and community responsibility. Those are the keys to success after sports. And, I, and I'll tell you that to this day, I have a number of guys, actually one guy is still playing, Sam Cassell, if you can believe that. You know, I stopped in um, 1997, and Sam is still playing to this day. He was a 95 or 96, uh, 96 client. And he's one of the few guys that's remaining right now. Joe Smith is another who was the number one pick in the draft. Um, but in the end, it came down to a choice that I had to make. And I dare say that each of you at some point in time, if you're climbing that ladder to success, you're going to reach that crossroads. You're going to reach that crossroads of pecuniary gain, fame, fortune, or being true to ethical responsibility. And I think that to each their own, everybody's going to make a choice. But remember that once you've made that choice, you're going to have to live with it. And many times, you're going to have to pay for it. You know, I didn't have enough to pay for it. But more than anything else, I knew I had to live with myself. And I also believed that reputation and credibility was so much more important 
than actual hard dollars. The dollars will come. You know, it, it, sooner or later, you're going to find a way to be able to take care of yourselves and take care of your families and, and live well. But turn it on its head. Once you lose your reputation and your credibility, you never get it back. You never get it back. And that's the choice that I made. And I, I'm very fortunate. And I'm not here to be any paragon of virtue. You know, I'm not, um, I'm not the angel that you all think I am. Uh, <laughs> But nevertheless, I, I'm proud of the choice that I made. And it, and it has served me well, because what happened during that time, and actually prior to that, I became involved in television. While I was at the district attorney's office, I was called by Jefferson Pilot, who, as you all know, does the regional broadcast for the um, ACC and the SEC. And I was asked, hey, you ever think about doing television? No. Why don't you come down? We've got a slate of about five or six games. We'll give you a tryout. The person who did that was an executive producer by the name of Mike Berg. And um, lo and behold, I had never given it any thought. But once I went down there, I was grilled by the people who owned um, Raycom Sports. They had never had an African-American basketball analyst. Hence, all the stereotypes abound. Well, um, how does he speak? Uh, can, he, can he articulate the words? <laughs> Damn, I'm in Harvard Law School. <laughs> but I answered the questions. I, um, and, you know, I got the games. And eventually, I, I think they finally understood that, you know, I was decent. So I, I think that it was something that at uh, first was more an attraction to me as opposed to being able to use it to some positive benefit. But as I said, once I got out of sports agent business, which I stepped out of television, by the time I became an agent, I was already doing the NCAA tournament for CBS. But I decided that representing athletes, having read the horror stories of guys being swindled, misused, abused, guys who finished their careers with nothing after having everything, that it was time for somebody to step in and essentially become a guide, become an advocate, become counsel. And so I saw what I thought was a higher calling, to try to give something back. Um, so I stepped out of sports broadcasting. And, and you know, it's, it's almost like the, um, the treadmill. Once you step off that thing, it's very hard to get back on. But I was pretty fortunate that, you know, I probably left a decent enough impression that when I left the sports agent business, ESPN brought me back. And from there... You know, that's when my broadcasting career just began again and continues to now. But the thing about the broadcasting that ultimately dawned on me was, hey, this is my bully pulpit. This is a place to be able to establish the principles, to establish the philosophy that I think is important, not only for athletes, but to fans, to people who follow the sport, people who live the sport. This is a time to kind of inject my views and my opinions as to what sports is about, the perspective that we should have on sports, the priority that we should place on sports, and the place in which sports belongs. Now, I'm not saying that, again, I'm some you know, philosopher, that I'm someone that necessarily has to be listened to and, and adhered to, but in the end, you know, I thought that this was a unique place. Just as I tried to do that as, as a representative of athletes, this was an even better place because there weren't nearly the constraints. Certainly there are verbal constraints, and I try to tell Billy Packer that every day, but he just doesn't listen to me. <laughs> but I think that the opportunity that television has given me um, is something that, you know, I, I can't, abuse, nor can I step away from. I can't abdicate that responsibility. Um, you know, all the issues that we talked about, that I just talked about, uh, came pretty much full circle as I sat and I watched collegiate athletes begin as freshmen, you know, finish as sophomores or seniors, um, and to see what happens afterwards. The ability to interact with them on a face-to-face -face basis as well as through the medium of television, I think and I hope has had some influence on some of these young men. 
Um, as I continued to do television, I also decided, and pardon me, because coming down to lovely North Carolina, the pollen is unreal. And you know, my eyes are tearing, my nose is running, and you can probably hear that, but you know, bear with me. Um, it, it came down to a point where you know, I got a little bit restless. You know, I had withdrawn from the practice of law to private, private practice, and I needed something else to do. And of course, as serendipity would be, phone rings, and someone who knew me, understood who I was, asked if I'd like to lead a, an education company. It was an education technology company backed by VC money. Um, unfortunately, they had burned $30 million prior, prior to asking me to come aboard. And so now I was the turnaround specialist. But they saw an opportunity to market. They saw an opportunity to restructure uh, the, the strategy. And instead of being a B2B company where they would try to sell to, I mean, a B2C company where they try to sell straight to consumers, we changed it so that in recognizing a bigger social issue, which was the achievement gap, which, again, is the gap between the scores of affluent or actually middle class and, and, and more affluent students versus those who are lower economic scale, you know, we wanted to try to do something. We wanted to try to provide technology that was going to help them on standardized tests. And so we were able to turn it around. We got AOL to become a partner. Um, we really built it up to the point where, despite losing 30 million bucks, within three years they were able to sell the company. Now, they, you know, that was fine, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. The fact is, though, that you know, I made out well enough to take another year off and decide what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was go back to law. Because once again, you know, when you're in a state of flux or confusion, you always go back to the thing that you know best. And so from that standpoint, I decided that I needed to take a, a real close look at law firms out there. Where could I not only do the things I like to do, continue to be a broadcaster, but also recognize, again, that it is so important to be able to disseminate that philosophy. And LaBeouf Lamb really provided that opportunity. You know, it was a long process in talking to a lot of firms, but ultimately, this was a, a firm that wasn't too large, that had reach globally. You know, primarily they're involved in energy, insurance, we have a robust litigation practice, IP practice, as well as um, some other areas that are probably more international in scope. But in the end, <clears throat> they uh, provided me an opportunity not only to get involved, but also to do something else, which is what I wanted to build a sports practice. And so we're in the process of doing that right now. Um, as, as a firm, we represent the United States Tennis Association, we represent the NCAA, we've represented players. And it's interesting that we represented players in arbitration. It's interesting you mentioned, you know, one of the uh, icons of the sneaker wars, uh, Sonny Vaccaro. Uh, but we represented a client who had an issue with an icon of the sneaker wars and ultimately did enough research in getting involved in this arbitration with the sneaker company as well as the agent that we found out that, you know, this guy, we could, we could actually... Uh, put forth a civil RICO case against these folks. You know, without going into the sneaker wars and the, um, the, the, the obvious um, problems that you have with the shoe companies getting involved in youth basketball and other areas, but we started, I started to realize how deep, you know, this influence, and I don't know if you've read the book Soul Influence at all. If you haven't and you're interested in sports and you're interested in representing athletes, you're interested in understanding the interactions between the shoe companies and the professional leagues as well as the athletes, it's a book that, that's a must read. It's called Soul Influence, S-O-L-E. Um, after understanding all of that, I started once again to get back on my, my war horse, this time with regard to youth basketball. And so, you know, I was fortunate to be able to write some articles and Next thing you know, I'm talking to folks at the NCAA, we're talking to coaches and others, and that's how, in part, how the college uh, basketball partnership was formed, primarily with a focus on youth basketball to try to rescue young people from those influences, to try to set a different course for youth basketball. Now, I'm not saying that the sneaker problems and the money thrown around by the big companies was the sole contributing factor, 
And there were other things. The United States keeps losing <laughs> in the world championship game. They lose in the Olympics. Our brand of basketball has become a mere shadow of what it used to be, the lack of fundamentals, the lack of focus and preparation, the lack of teamwork. But all those things are learned on the youth basketball level, and they're carried forth through high school and college and into the professional ranks. And it was incumbent upon all the stakeholders. You know, if we were going to maintain that grip on basketball dominance, it was important to the stakeholders, the shoe companies, the NCAA, the NBA, coaches, youth basketball coaches, et cetera. It was incumbent upon them to get together and find ways to solve the problem. And that's what the uh, College Basketball Partnership is all about. Um, you know, I've been on other boards, uh, the Knight Commission. And I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Knight Commission? One, uh, we must be doing a terrific job. because. But the Knight Commission it has been, um, over the last 11 years, well, actually, let me see, 91, about 14 years now, has been kind of a watchdog for college athletics, not just basketball, but athletics in general. You know, seeking to find solutions to creeping over commercialism, to eligibility issues, to graduation rate problems. I mean, you name the issue in college sports, the Knight Commission has tried to tackle it and investigate it and come up with some solutions. And we're in the process of, on a continual basis, doing that. We advise and Many times we chastise and admonish the NCAA. Uh, they listen. If you know anything about the, the um, academic progress reports that are coming up, you know, Duke doesn't have to worry about it. But there are a lot of schools who historically have come under the graduation rate as measured. And in the next couple of years, you're going to find some big name schools who will lose scholarships, who will be sanctioned for the lack of progress made by, by students. That's what part of all of that participation in the Knight Commission and others is all about. Trying to improve, trying to make college sports what it truly should be, and that is part of the education process, as opposed to something separate and apart um, from a commercial standpoint. So in a nutshell, I mean, I hope that kind of gives you a, a basis of who I am and, and what I've been about. Um, and now when we tackle the last part of the title, which was leadership, you know, the one thing that I've always adhered to as far as a philosophy is that leadership is not about increasing your following. Leadership is about creating other leaders. And that's why it's so important and you look around at many people who are visible and who are preaching from the bully pulpit, it's not so much to persuade you, it's to motivate you. It's to understand the issues. Yes, there, there is a bright line in many of our minds as to what is right and what is wrong with sports, but nevertheless, for those of you who want to be involved, the idea is to motivate you to get involved. You know, I have a, a, a short period of time in which I'm going to be able with my colleagues and my fellow board members and commission members to really be able to kind of capture the attention of the industry. And it is important to kind of continue to develop minds, continue to develop ideas, continue to, to try to stimulate creativity on the how to find solutions. And for those who don't think anything needs to be solved, that's fine too. You need to be able to establish a position and speak out on it. But the idea, nevertheless, is to become active. And that's, that's one of the things that I've always figured that that was one of my responsibilities. You know, I, I think you use your visibility and your credibility for progress, which is what I've tried to do. Um, I think sitting on boards, sitting on commissions, writing articles, being outspoken uh, on various issues is, is part of my responsibility. You know, I've been given an awful lot. Certainly, I've worked for it as an athlete, and certainly um, in, in my post-athletic career. But I also recognize that it's important to be able to give something back. And it's a trite statement. You hear it all the time from athletes, et cetera. But it, it loses its triteness, if you will, when it's acted upon, when someone is actually involved and in doing it. And so to go back almost full circle, 
What you're being prepared for right now is leadership. What you're being prepared for right now is to utilize those skills in a way that is going to fuel progress. You know, reactionary, reactionary thought, um, maintaining the status quo, anybody can do that. That's easy. You know, the question is how do we move forward? In what direction do we move forward? And the mere fact that you're involved in, in, in this group right here tells me obviously that sports is a big part of your life. And if it is a big part of your life, then it's important for you to understand that there are roles to be played. Not everybody can be a CBS broadcaster or an ESPN broadcaster, although most people think they can. Like I said, I read those blogs. Uh, but in the end, you can also you know, be general counsel for ABC, for ESPN. You, know, you can run some of those organizations. You can be the president of the NCAA. There are so many areas and aspects with your training, with your foundation, that you can fulfill. And I'm hoping that you know, my example, which a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm probably no different than any of you and probably come from a background in some ways, shapes, and forms might be more humble than yours, which is not to brag, which is not to you know, kind of uh, elicit some type of sympathy from me, but just to say, damn, if I can do it, you guys can do it. And you don't have to have been an All-American or professional basketball player to do it. You know, George Bodenheimer, I hope George doesn't hear this, he can't go between his legs, he can't dunk, but he's the head of ESPN. He started out, believe it or not, as a driver for Dick Vitale. Yeah. He started out as a driver, almost a gopher. And now he's president of ESPN, CEO of ESPN. And believe me, he has impact. Uh, some people might think that you know, ESPN is going in the wrong direction. But nevertheless, ESPN, more than probably any other medium that we can look at, has influenced society, has influenced sports. You know, I'll leave it up to you to judge whether it's for the positive or the negative. Since they pay my check, you know what I have to say. <laughs> um, so I guess that's, that's pretty much it as far as any type of formal talk. You know, I'm hoping that you know, my story, that my philosophy has kind of generated some thought, kind of, kind of ignited something inside of you guys. And it may stay there for a while. You may forget what I'm saying today. But maybe next year, or for those of you who are in your third year, when you get to your jobs, um, wherever they may be, or if you get into something that's not sports related, but ultimately you find opportunities, hopefully that spark will come back. Hopefully there's something that I said here that'll resonate. And that instead of going, nah, you'll say, okay, I'll give it a try. Because that's what I did. I walked through some doors where the lights were off and I had no idea until ultimately I could flick on the switch. But you'll never know what's inside until you walk inside. And so that kind of risk taking, that type of um, adventurousness is something that I think that everybody should at least exercise once. And so with that, I know the other part of it was March Madness. And you know, we can talk about the 19 year old rule. We can talk about graduation rates. We can talk about commercialization. We can talk about or commercialism. We can talk about pay for play. We can talk about Florida repeating. We can talk about Maryland losing the Butler. We can talk about Duke losing the first round. We can talk about anything. So having said all of that, uh, I'm hoping that, again, that you know, my story will be something that um, you guys can use as a reference. Thanks. We're not finished. We're not finished. Thank you, but we're not finished. Anybody have any questions? I know you have questions. Yes, sir. Can you speak about sort of the psychological impact of coming from this sort of modest background that suddenly you've got like an MBA salary and maybe a bit Well, of MBA salary back then is probably what first years start with in uh, New York. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, and maybe your, your sort of sense of professional obligation 
uh, representing some of these young people who are in your shoes, uh, you sort of need to maybe impress upon them the fact that this doesn't necessarily last forever. You can be injured. You, can, you know, this is sort of a fleeting moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's important to keep in the back of their heads. That shouldn't be something that's in the forefront. But the idea is preparation. Be prepared. But more importantly, even if they go through their careers without an instance of injury and they're able to play to their potential and maximize their earning potential, when they're done, we're talking about guys who also maybe come from modest backgrounds, maybe even more humble than mine, who now have money, hopefully have an education, and hopefully have had the counsel and the experience as they were getting to that point where they now can walk out of this thing and become captains of industry, where they can own businesses, where they can have influence, um, and where they can develop that visibility and credibility. I mean, these are the things. I, I talk to athletes, and when I tell them that, believe it or not, you, know, you guys have been endowed with an innate intelligence because you can't play any sport without having the innate intelligence to do it. You have a work ethic. You have persevered. You have poise under pressure. You've got all of these qualities that corporate America covets. Now, add to that independent resources. You know, the world is at your fingertips. I would love to see what LeBron James does 15 years from now with the money he's amassed. I would love to see what uh, Kobe Bryant or Shaquille O'Neal, what they do with the resources they've amassed over these years. You know, I would love to counsel them. Um, you know, I hear LeBron James is now hobnobbing with Warren Buffett. You know, hopefully he'll start a hedge fund. But in the end, I, I'm saying, and, and I say that kind of in jest, but also hopefully there'll be some vehicle where they can be in the vanguard of change and not just sit back. You know, I tell a lot of guys who don't go to school, who do well, I said, you still have to prepare because when your career is over, and it will be over like that, you know, you're not going to be able to play golf for the next 45 years. You've got to be able to do something. You're used to being in the limelight. You're used to being vital. And, you know, there are serious repercussions. I'm not going to blame the, the next anecdote real quick or the next story I'm going to say. I'm not going to blame it on the idle nature of this individual. But I'm going to tell you right now, looking at the totality of circumstances and looking at the facts and evidence without passing judgment, Jason Williams, do you think, and I'm not talking about Jason Williams from Duke, I'm talking about Jason Williams who was on trial for manslaughter. You look at the facts of that case and it makes you think, if he was really involved in a number of things where he could utilize his resources, where he maintained a visibility, where he was talking about positive things, and yeah, I know he was on television with NBC, uh, but he was taking more of the role of comedian than anything else. If he was truly involved in something that was positive from a social standpoint, do you think the circumstances that ultimately led to the poor guy's demise, um, do you think that he would have been involved in something like that? You know, you have to ask yourself that question. And I ask guys that all the time. So, I mean, those, that's the message. Um, and, you know, there, there are variations on that message. But nevertheless, these guys have to recognize the power that they have if they choose to prepare for it. Anybody else? Yes. You had mentioned the, uh, the age eligibility requirement for the MBA. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering, with your work with the Knight Commission, what you, uh, what you thought about um, how the rule exists now and whether it should be changed. I mean, anecdotally, it seems like it could be a positive thing because it exposes people to the university environment who maybe wouldn't have gone. But you look at, I think I saw on ESPN, Greg Oden's class load this semester at Ohio State as a freshman was seven credits, introduction to agriculture and the history of rock and roll was all he was taking. So it seems like this is not something, uh, not a academic rigorous schedule that's going to be pointed toward actually getting a degree. So in a sense, is it is it helping young men and athletes to uh, the, the, this rule as it's structured now? Well, I, I think that, and I haven't seen, I haven't seen that, and, and I dare say that, you know, basketball is a two-semester sport. So he had to have been taking something that was going to keep him on progress to graduate. Because Ohio State loses. If he leaves school and he doesn't have eligibility, then 
you know, they get what they say, they get two points taken away from them. And ultimately that affects their APR status, which if it brings them under the number, they could ultimately lose scholarships. So I'm not so sure, and you know, again, there's, there's a certain level of exaggeration that goes on, even in reporting. I mean, you never let the facts get in the way of a good story, as they say. Um, but in the end, the thing about it, I think the rule was passed less about guys actually going to school and getting a degree, but more about just the maturation process. Um, and you know, I don't think there can be any doubt that having someone who otherwise wouldn't have gone to college on a university campus within a university community that now understands what that university community expects of them, and they can have expectations of what that community should expect or what they can expect from that community, I think that helps in the maturation process. Despite you know, what he might have been carrying as a, as a class load, I mean, Greg Oden has been on record that he likes school. He likes going to class. And you know, I don't care what it is, if you can get a guy to continue to go to class, ultimately, you know, you've got something there. Um, the thing about it that I like about the rule is that, that delayed gratification, one of the biggest problems we have today is instant gratification, particularly among young people. You know, I want it, I want it now, I want to go. Forget about taking, from, to get from A to Z, forget about B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. You know, they want to jump from A to Z. And that's, that's injurious. That's injurious to, you know, their development and their growth. And Kevin Durant is another guy now. They said he had a 3.0. It's been reported he has a 3.0 on camps and is still going to class. I was in Atlanta Monday. This guy has won every single Player of the Year award that there is. And he left Monday because they had to get back to class. Which, you know, it didn't surprise me because I know what kind of young man he is. And he may still come out. The value of this rule is not so much for the Greg Odens and the Kevin Durants. Their futures are made for them. It's for the hundreds and the thousands of others who think they're Kevin Durant and Greg Oden. Uh, Paul Harris, who plays for Syracuse, was one of those guys mentioned as someone who's going to jump from high school directly to the pros, but for the 19-year rule. Well, when he got to college at Syracuse, he couldn't even start for his team. And it was only in the NIT that he started to really show that he has the potential to play on the next level. And that's an illustration of the point that I've been making all along, and that is you're going to have a sizable number of people coming in thinking they're going to go to the pros, but ah, here I have to go to school. And you have to go to school because you have to remain eligible. And then you start to recognize their games are lacking. And they've been told, you know, you're, you're not ready yet. Go back another year. And there's going to be another significant number who go back that second year, and they still haven't fixed the problems with their games. They still haven't gotten to that point. So they have to go back a third year. And gee, pretty soon somebody might even get an education. Imagine that. And that's the whole issue. You know, as I said, the Greg Odens and the Kevin Durants I mean, you know, there are going to be prodigies. LeBron James is a prodigy. You know, we wouldn't take Mozart and put him in Juilliard and say, you got to go there for 12 years now, would we? But for everybody else who think, you know, they play with two fingers and they think they're Mozart, you know, you've got to go. So in the end, I think the rule has, has great value. I think it's also valuable to the NBA because all too often they were taking flyers on some of these high school kids and they were plunking down big dollars. And it was almost a windfall to these kids because it took them four years to earn it and some of them haven't even earned it. Now the NBA has an opportunity to evaluate them in a more representative environment where they're competing against better players and other players. And so now they can make more, uh, more informed judgments, just like any other business when you're evaluating an asset. You know, the more time you have, the more opportunity you have to look under the hood, the better your judgment's going to be. And so that year, I wish it was two years, actually, maybe even three. Maybe the baseball rule could work, although I, I think that mandatorily you have to stick every, I think you should push everybody into college and then make the decision. But you know the baseball rule, if you're drafted out of high school, you can go. But once you enroll in college, you've got to stay for three years. You have to wait until after your junior year. But in the end, uh, the most important thing is to 
if they're eligible, if they're capable of doing the work, which is another issue, that you have to bring kids in who are capable of doing the work. If you can't do college work, you don't belong in college. Maybe you belong in junior college. Maybe you need to take remedial work if you truly want to be in school. Um, and that also puts pressure on the high schools. You know, when you could jump, you know, from high school to the pros, you know, the high schools would just commit academic fraud and just, you know, let you do whatever you want to do because they know where you're going. Now, you know, the impact is greater. The rep reputation, reputation and credibility of the high schools are on the line now. They can't send an unprepared kid to college because it would be a disaster. So I think it's starting to have a ripple effect in a positive way. Um, I think it's going to be reevaluated and, you know, maybe, who knows, there might be a way to reopen the negotiations and add a second year or even a third year to it. Because in the long run, and, and, and let me go back, and I don't mean to, to digress or even go out on a tangent on this, but I just want to speak to, you know, the totality of this argument. The other argument was, well, why do you care? Everybody, you know, guys in hockey can go from high school to the pros and from tennis, blah, blah, blah. From my way of thinking, and this is me, you know, and I'm paternal. You know, I've got two boys. And the overwhelming impact is usually on African-American males. And if you're going to look at the entirety of what's going on in this country, I think it's important that some of us act in a paternal fashion towards young African-American males. Because the flip side of it is, one out of every three is in touch with the criminal justice system, whether arrest, probation, or incarceration. And now you have guys who, as I mentioned before, could be captains of industry one day if they were pushed through the right process. And so at this point in time, as a father, you're not getting any choices. You know, I don't give my sons choices when it comes to academics or hanging around or hanging out. They don't have choices right now. There was an article in the New York Times, I think today, it was either the Times, it couldn't have been USA Today, it was the Times, uh, speaking, speaking about the formation of the brain and how teenagers still haven't had that part of the brain that allows them to make informed judgment and risk. And therefore, the psychologist was saying that we shouldn't give them that choice, that we should continue to help them make these decisions until they've had a time where, you know, they can, their brain is fully formed where they can make informed choices. Now, of course, some of us still haven't had it fully formed, but that's a whole other story. Shame on us. <laughs> But in the end, that's, that's what I think the rule ultimately does. I've kind of broadened it and made it more universal. But in the end, I think that that's essentially what this rule is about. And, and I think it's positive. Maybe one more short question. Yes, sir. Um, in light of the story you related about your experience with the Public Defender's Office and evaluating uh, how hard to seek discipline with the serial shop uh, um, Offenders, right. right. Um, do you, when you think about um, the problems that the NFL is experiencing with the Pac-Man Jones saga and the Bengals and all that, do you evaluate that with the same type of thinking, or do you, would you think of it as an, an example where stricter discipline is necessary from the league perspective, taking totally aside what the criminal justice system does? Well, I mean, I think you're talking about two different things. When you talk about the serial offender, Serial offender doesn't care what the punishment is anymore. I mean, you, when you say serial, you have to look behind the reasons why. If they're a sociopath and, you know, a danger to society, yeah, let's stick them in. This was a shoplifter. This, there's a problem there, and you've got to analyze and evaluate. On the side of the NFL, I think that it's strict discipline is the answer, simply because why do guys play? They play for the love of the game. Take the game away from them. Why do other guys play? They play for the money. Well, if you take the game away, you're going to take the money away. In the end, you're going to, you're going to conform behavior on that basis. The problem, and you know, I'm a union guy too, the problem is I think there are times when the union looks out for its best interests instead of the best interests of their members. And I think in this instance, though, I think that the NFLPA has been strangely silent on the issue simply because they know, as I know, the only way you're going to answer that is to come down hard. If you want to save your league, 
If you don't want to suffer the same image problems that the NBA suffered back in the late 70s, early 80s, you've got to be proactive. I mean, right now it'd be reactive, but you've got to be proactive in setting up policies and setting up a, a structure of uh, rules that essentially are going to be deterrent. And that's really the, where the evaluation comes in. I mean, it's like the criminal justice system. What's the, what are the goals of incarceration? You know, isolation, deterrence, rehabilitation, punishment, retribution. You know, which of those fits? And in this case, deterrence is probably the priority. You don't want it to happen again. You, I think uh, Goodell will take no glee in punishing somebody. But if that punishment will serve as a deterrent for the next act, then you have to do it. I think there's one more question, if you got, because I know you raised your hand before, and I kind of skipped over you, unless you don't have a question any longer. Oh, well, I was going to ask about the 19 age rule. Oh, okay. So, uh, but I guess I was wondering, would you recruit guys who you know are only going to stay for one year if you're looking at developing a program? Personally, no. Um, but then again, I'm not coaching. I, I think that... You know, there are a lot of guys who have a great deal of, of luck and success with guys that you can develop. And I'm not saying this just because I went to the University of Maryland, but I found out something. McDonald's All-American Game. I actually was asked to do that. I'm not going to say my arm was twisted or anything, but I'm not one to, you know, glorify high school players uh, simply because, again, I think they're too young and, you know, that's too much pressure. Um, you know, an O.J. Mayo can have a bad game, and after the game, he's still got reporters surrounding him three deep. This guy's 18 years old, and he's got to deal with that. But in the end, um, the school with the most McDonald's All-Americans since they started that is North Carolina with 48. The next highest is Duke with 26. When you look at the national champions since the McDonald's All-American game began, every single team that's won a national championship, has had at least one McDonald's All-American except for one, the 2002 Maryland team. They had 50 year seniors, so it took them a long time to develop them. But my point is, as a coach, that's what I want. I want guys who have potential I can develop. Now, of course, I need my athletic director and my president to work with me because that means maybe we're not going to win right away. But once you develop a program, you develop uh, a reputation for being able to teach I think that's just as vital as it is in winning a national, ch and, and then you ultimately win something. That's just as, as vital as winning a national championship with a one and done young man. Uh, because then all you become is a warehouse. I think you sell your soul to the devil more than anything else when you do that. Um, you know, Texas got Kevin Durant, and I love Rick Barnes, and Rick and I have been friends for a long time. You know, how do you pass up a Kevin Durant? But by the same token, Kevin Durant as good as he was, as dominant as he was, didn't win a championship for you. Now you're going to lose him. Now, does that mean you bring on the next one and then the next one? And ultimately, you've lost the opportunity to bring somebody who you can develop from freshman to senior year. And it might be as good in their senior year as this guy was in his freshman year. And to have a continuum. Um, from, from the game of basketball, to me as a coach, that's my challenge. My challenge not only is to develop talent as it is, but also develop talent that's not there, but is potential. So to answer your question from a personal basis, I'd rather have the developable young man who in two, three years can be that All-American and demonstrates the ability of the team and the coaching staff to be able to teach and mold and blend and, and create chemistry and to have that ongoing as a tradition as opposed to the one guy who's going to come for a year and gone. Where's the tradition in that? That's it. Adam, thank you.